Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for that introduction. I'm Martin Green from UNSW Sydney, and uh, today I'll be talking about efficiency limits of some of the competing silicon cell technologies, um, namely PERC, uh, Topcon, uh, Heterojunction, and IBC. Um, so uh, we've been able to calculate efficiency limits for silicon cells for almost 40 years now. It actually gets simpler to analyze the cells as they get uh, better. So um, uh, I did my first analysis uh, back in 83, and we just made the world's most efficient solar cell, our first world record, and that was 18% efficient. And uh, with this analysis, we're projecting efficiencies of 29.7%. And uh, soon after, TG and Alia published a similar analysis and they got exactly the same result, 29.7%. Everything's uh, changed since then, all the parameters that go into this calculation, but the end result has stayed the same. So the, the using the present values, you get 29.5% and the IV curve there is shown in the background. To derive that type of result, you've got to assume everything's perfect. So the wafer is just limited by the intrinsic recombination processes, namely Auger recombination and radiative recombination, and the surfaces are perfect. There's no recombination along the surfaces and the contacts are highly selective. So one contact lets the holes out and nothing else, and the other one lets the electrons out. So with that type of assumption, you come up with a limit of about 29.5% for 150 micron uh, thick cell. So um, yeah, and there's the parameters that I, that I show there uh, on the graph. It turns out to get that uh, limiting efficiency, you need to have essentially uh, the cell in high injection. So these calculations are normally done with intrinsic material. You know, I might add that when, you know, the initial calculations were done, 29.5 or 7 sounded like an enormously high value. But now I think it's a value that we're going to approach quite quickly over the rest of this decade. So by the end of the decade, I think we'll be quite close to those values. But this is what we need. We need material that's in high injection at the maximum power point. And uh, for the limiting cell efficiency, you'll have a carrier concentration of about seven by 10 to the 15th per cubic centimeter. So for intrinsic material, it hasn't got any conductivity to speak of, but once you apply the voltage and get these carrier concentrations within the cell bulk, um, the, the resistivity becomes quite usable. So that corresponds to a 0.5 ohm centimeter material and uh, 36 ohms per square. So you've got plenty of conductivity to um, conduct carriers both across the cell and laterally within the cell. Because you need to be in high injection, it places um, bounds on what type of resistivities you can have in the wafer. So to get that high injection condition or to get efficiencies over 29%, you need to have N-type wafers whose resistivity is greater than two ohm centimeter or P-type greater than 0.5 ohm centimeter. So that actually corresponds to carrier concentrations about 10 times higher in the P-type wafer. And that's because P-type material is inherently more resistant to Auger recombination than N-type. And uh, although these calculations are generally done for intrinsic material, there's a very slight maximum on the P-type side of the dividing line, about 20 ohm, per, 20 ohm uh, centimeter material is where you'll pick up the maximum uh, efficiency. So uh, how good does everything need to be to approach these limits? And uh, if we just look at the wafer properties, so we've got intrinsic Auger and radiative recombination going on in there, but how much extra recombination can we tolerate from defects within the wafer material? And uh, the graph on the right just shows the effect of adding five milliseconds of, desect, of defect recombination. And you can see that knocks the IV curve about quite severely. Surprisingly, you'd get little change in the current output and very little in the voltage, but what it knocks about is the fill factor. And I'll explain uh, why that is so. And this is quite important for approaching these limits as we go on. Um, 
So you, you get about a 6% reduction uh, if you go to five milliseconds. You need about 30 milliseconds in the wafers to um, to get over 88% figure compared to the 89.1, which is the value for the limiting efficiency. These values are quite high, but I think we're going to see progress towards them over the next few years. Um, so that's uh, the wafer quality. And uh, as you go to these more sophisticated structures that I'll be talking about, you become more dependent on the wafer quality to get the high efficiency. So you can see the perk down the bottom of this graph. This is from ISFH, the reference down there in the corner. But, uh, you know, the perk is quite tolerant to material lifetime. But some of these other technologies like the IBC and the heterojunction, a lot more sensitive to lifetimes. And, you know, that in the past has created problems for companies like SunPower and and Panasonic uh, making these high efficiency devices because getting consistently good quality material hasn't always been easy. And, uh, you know, I noticed early this year at the PV Tech uh, heterojunction uh, workshop that um, Verizon, who's doing well with the heterojunction approaches, complained that one of the issues they were facing was getting consistent in type wafer quality from their suppliers. So still an issue. So I think over the last few years, we've seen tremendous progress with wafer quality. And uh, I think that's going to continue. So we're going to go from tolerating multi-crystalline wafers just a few years ago to tolerating wafers of superb quality, like even better than used in microelectronics. And I think that's that's what's going to happen. And that's going to allow us to obtain these uh, high efficiencies. So the other thing you have to look after is the surfaces. And if you add up the, the way these are generally characterized are in terms of a set diode saturation current density J naught, if you add up all the J naught contributions from all the things that are circled there, you've got to keep them below 10 femto amps, 10 to the minus 15 amps um, per centimeter squared, um, or else your curve will move too far away from the ideal. So in this case, you see that you're taking a hit both with the fill factor and the voltage um, if you uh, introduce uh, surfaces that are non-ideal. This is assuming the wafers are ideal, incidentally. Um, this just shows uh, what happens as you vary that value. So the little dotted line there shows the 10 femtoamp value. And uh, we can see that we're taking about an equal hit in the fill factor and voltage. You know, for more mundane cells like we've been used to in the past, you can change the voltage and you get very little change in the fill factor, as you can see over on the right hand side there. But um, as we push towards these fundamental limits, a small increase in voltage makes a big impact upon the fill factor. And this is an area that we haven't really capitalized on yet, but I think we will in the future. So the reason that we need high injection in these wafers is if you stick to a cell in low injection where the ideality factor is generally one or higher, this is the maximum fill factor that you can get down the bottom here in the dotted line compared to the, um, you know, for the voltages that are shown at the top there. So you're limited to a fill factor of say 85.5% with these very high voltages even if you're stuck in a low injection regime. So you need to be in this high injection regime to get these high fill factors. And there's a disproportionate fill factor increase as you home in on this uh, ultimate cell that has uh, zero contribution from the surfaces. So less than two femtoamps per centimeter squared is sort of the aim to get a fill factor over 88%. So it's a 4% boost by going from low injection to high injection in the fill factor itself. So I'm calling this uh, high injection fill factor supercharging. And that's the reason we'll see where some of the cells are starting to get some of this benefit, but uh, in the future, we've already got to capitalize on this. So, you know, you might say, you know, heterojunctions are now giving their full voltage potential and as much current as you'd expect from them. You know, what else can you do to improve them? And the answer is the fill factor. And there's that 4% gain waiting to be tapped into there. So all these calculations that I've gone over so far, have been, we've been able to do them for 40 years, but um, more recently, there's been uh, new insights into the contact selectivity, like we've talked about selective contacts for years. And in fact, if you look at my 1982 textbook, you'll see I tried to describe P and junction operation in terms of selective contact. But um, what's happened recently is ISFH have come up with a way of quantifying 
the, the contact selectivity that's quite useful. So if you, if you see, notice the contact at the top there in brown, if you'd expand its area, you'll uh, increase the J naught associated with that contact if you reference it to the total cell area, you know, making the contact bigger, you're gonna have more recombination at it. Dead simple. And then, but also you're gonna decrease the contact resistivity, you know, making the contact bigger, it's gonna be less resistive. So that product between the J naught and rho C, at least the first order, will be constant as you vary that contact size. And this is the thing that gives this technique uh, developed by ASH, ISFH some real uh, power, I believe. So they've defined this parameter that has this product incorporated into it. Uh, they call it the, uh, the selectivity. And uh, you take the log of it because you get very big numbers if you don't. Um, but that quantity there has some physical significance. It has this important parameter in there, the product of those two terms. But um, um, physically, it's the log of the ratio of the incremental minority carrier resistance at short circuit compared to the majority carrier resistance. So it um, sounds a bit esoteric and it, it, you, know, you couldn't really measure it on a cell, but it is conceptually something that has a physical significance. So if you look at all these selective contacts that people have explored and plot them on a uh, J naught versus contact recessivity type of graph or vice versa in this case, um, you'll get points all over the shop. So the triangles uh, show diffuse junction devices. So they tend to be high up in this graph. And uh, we've got aluminum back surface fields, you know, fairly high on the graph. Um, and then we've got things like, um, polysilicon tunneling contacts, which are at the low end, and um, amorphous silicon type contacts uh, there also. But the, the solid lines there show lines of constant uh, J naught rho C. So uh, if, you, if you notice these two points that are circled, they are just about touching this dotted line that you can see there. So, um, you know, the, the diffuse junction at the top has a really enormous uh, J naught, so 190 times higher than this very good um, polysilicon contact here. Um, but also because it lies on this dotted line, it means that the contact resistance is 190 times lower. So that if you um, reduce the size of the contact here to 190 times below that of the below that of the um, value for this contact here, this would sort of slide down the line and end up on top. You divide the J naught by 190 and increase the, the um, contact resistance by that 190 times. So that's the power of the method is, uh, is in that relationship that you see there. So the advantage of this definition, it just gives all those lines a name and number. And, uh, you know, uh, so this um, 15 here means that this parameter tends out to be 15. And the interesting thing you can do is you can work out the efficiency as a function of that number of that selectivity. And this is the calculation that's shown here. Like this isn't anything magical, you know, the, just for any uh, value of that parameter, you can work out a maximum efficiency that you could get with that combination of, of uh, values. And for one particular combination within that constant product, you'll end up with this maximum efficiency that's plotted here. So for 10 to the 14th, for example, you ended up you know, with efficiency of 23% or whatever. And then the optimum value of the combination in the product is defined by just one of the two because you know the product. And that's generally specified in terms of the contact resistivity because that has you know, more physical significance, I guess. So um, you need about 0.2. Or if we go to the 10 to the 15, you uh, end up with um, efficiency close to 29% and uh, contact resistivity just below 0.1. So um, this line here corresponds to a selectivity of 10 to the 15. So if you take this contact here, it uh, the optimum value of the selectivity is shown in this other graph here corresponds to this point down here. So for this contact to reach the efficiency with just over 29%, you have to uh, reduce its contact area to get down to this value here. So it's about a factor of 10 reduction in the contact area. So 10% coverage with that contact, you know, is consistent with reaching efficiencies just over 29%.
So the, 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 the formula for the fraction is just the actual contact resistivity versus the ideal value that's shown in this graph here. So, you know, that's the power of the method. Um, and then if you have two contacts, you can um, work out these formula. So it turns out that the values approach those for the worse of the two contacts. So um, not too surprising. So with that theory behind us, we can start looking at the experimental technologies and where they're at and where they're heading towards. So these are the four of them, my standard drawings for them. And on the right there, I've shown the IV curves of what are presently the best representatives of each of those technologies on large area wafers. So all in the 24 to 25 plus sort of range and compared them to the limiting efficiency. So uh, straight off, you'll notice there's an outlier there and that's the heterojunction technology which has already have voltages very close to the limit, but currents that are appreciably lower than the other technologies. So, and, and that's because of the amorphous silicon and the transparent conductors that are on the top surface of the device blocking the light from getting into it. Um, the best uh, in terms of current is the IBC, no metal on the top, and you're losing about uh, 3% uh, of available current due to reflection losses and other non-idealities within the cell. So um, I think IBC, you know, naturally has the highest efficiency potential, but if you push things to the limit, I think you're looking at uh, efficiencies with IBC that are within about 5% of the fundamental limits. So that means efficiencies over 28%, I believe is what we'll, eventually see, you know, maybe towards the end of this decade with uh, IBC technologies. All the rest, if they can push to the fundamental limit with voltage, which is where they're all heading incidentally, so each of these is progressing towards that uh, fundamental limit as uh, in voltage as they get better, um, we'll, limit, we'll end up with uh, efficiencies that are about 2% lower, so maybe 27.5% type efficiencies. I think all these are capable of, except possibly heterojunction, unless you can get rid of this current loss. So while heterojunction is now one of the better technologies because of its very high voltages, in the fullness of time, I think we'll see the other sort of progressively catch up in voltage. So unless you can do something about the heterojunction current, it's gonna get surpassed by the others. So I'll talk a little bit about that as we move through. Okay, just looking at the, the contenders one by one, perk, so it's, it's the lowest efficiency of all the contenders at the moment, which is why people are looking at ways of replacing it. But is, has it really run out of puff or is it just really getting started? So uh, we can see the parameter is the best cell there and the, the weak link in the um, technology is the lower open circuit voltage where we're getting towards 700 millivolts, which once would have been a very high voltage, but these days it's low compared to what the other options are. So, uh, excuse me a sec, my lights just disappeared. Uh, looks like I can't get it back. I'll keep going. <laughs> um, the um, uh, fill factor is not all that great too, but improving the voltage should improve that. The big change that's uh, occurred that has probably made P-type more interesting, P-type wafers more interesting, is the switch to gallium doping. So, um, uh, remove some of the difficulties with... Uh, boron doping and you can see from this recent paper here that we're already getting effective lifetimes so the intrinsic one is even higher than this you know 10 milliseconds in high resistivity wafers so the uh, contacting scheme used with the perk is aluminium back surface field and diffused junctions which are these red circles regions here to the, towards the right so although the diffusions are improving um, you know, it's, it's still at the right-hand side, the low S end of the spectrum. But we can see that there's improvements possible perhaps by going to diffuse junctions. These brown regions here for the P type is in brown and the N type is in blue. Or going to these polysilicon tunneling contacts that are over here. An enormous range of possible values there for reasons I might get the chance to touch upon. So this is... Uh, uh, charts from ISFH just showing the historical progress with PERC efficiencies, so steady progression over the last few years, you know, largely contributed to by increasing voltage output. So the PERC plus is just bifacial, and this PERC plus polo is a combination of PERC with a tunneling polysilicon contact uh, 
shown here. Um, so what's happened in this structure, it's basically a standard perk, but the selective emitter contact here has been replaced by a polysilicon tunneling contact, which on those previous graphs was way over to the, to the left, the high S value region, which is where you need to push the efficiency up. And this uh, highest point on, on their chart is actually the cell in the background from uh, Longji, which um, you know has an increasing voltage. So this 694 that's associated that was you know a high voltage in 1919 in 2019 when that cell was reported. But um, nowadays, much higher values. Uh, well, many commercial manufacturers are getting that even without going to this structure here. So uh, look, going back to the future or forward to the past. This is the structure of the cell that I mentioned before, where we made our first 18% efficient cell back in 1983. And it actually had one of these passivated tunneling contacts on it, but in this case, based on titanium as the tunneling structure. So um, this idea of passivated structure is, is not really old. So this structure actually then evolved into the perk, and now we're seeing ongoing evolution of the perk into these passivated contacts. I'll just note as an aside that we also investigated polysilicon tunnel emitters back in this era, or even earlier, 1981, as a way of making these tunneling structures able to be uh, combined with screen printing. And um, a lot of the literature reviews of Topcom have overlooked that work. It's been included even in the textbooks that I've written since then, but that seems to have been missed. So that's one way of improving PERC, combining with some of the Topcon ideas. Uh, the problem with that structure shown at the bottom there is you have to pattern the polysilicon and there's not really been a really tidy way suggested for doing that yet. But if you just flip the structure over, this is what IASH have suggested. In a very recent paper, they report 716 millivolts with, with this structure here, which is you know pushing the perk further towards that limit. It's just a flipped over perk basically, but instead of using a sort of selective area contact with these tunneling contacts, putting them right over the rear. And you'll see the, the little red mushroom shapes at the bottom here, meant to represent pinholes in the oxide. And that's what gives um, these tunneling contacts the enormous range of possible values, the huge processing space to get really low values. The other thing you can do with PERC is replace the aluminium contacts by um, diffuse contacts, perhaps by laser doping them as suggested by ISC here. So moving on, getting back to the traditional Topcon structure, and this is the structure here, generally an N-type wafer and the best large area cells, again, being made by Longi, recently reported 25.2%. Improved voltage compared to the PERC is the main advantage, so 722 compared to 694. But even more recently, Longi's reported the same efficiency with a P-type wafer. So with the switch to gallium, the um, doping, the question is, you know, P-type P or N-type, which is going to be better for making these devices. And uh, ISE, the Fraunhofer Institute, have, uh, have, looked, have done very well with the laboratory cells. This, this is the traditional top con structure. If you go to the back surface, um, back junction version of this with P-type wafers, they've actually got higher values as noted here. So the uh, question remains P-type or N-type. I'll skip over this. I think there's room for further improvement. I believe that um, this is just a surface, uh, com -contrib the contribution of these surface diffusions to recombination in the cell. And um, the highest value they look at is 600 or electrostatically induced layers. But I believe there's probably an optimum doping in this case, not to provide lateral conductivity within the cell as it being the traditional role of these dope regions, but just to minimize surface recombination. So um, ISFH also analyzed similar structures, but from a slightly different perspective, looking at um, what you could do in the near term in production. And uh, we've got some of the standard structures that they've analyzed. And here's the perk with efficiencies uh, close to what people have realized in actuality on large wafers. And at the bottom right here is the Topcon 24.4. And I, I note that Jollywood is actually willing to sell you M10 wafers with um, 
uh, Topcon cells of this efficiency on it. So that also quite representative. And then this combination device here with Topcom localized area contacts, 24.1, which is very similar to what Longji has demonstrated. But with this structure here, which I think only they have been working on so far, they get the highest efficiency, 24.7%. Uh, so quite uh, interesting. So you might just need to, uh, this structure has to be simpler than the standard Topcon because you're just using aluminium BSF technology on the top. Okay, and then just looking further afield, adding Topcon to both sides, you can get further efficiency increases according to their simulations, but both of these are rear junction devices and uh, evidently the front junction devices aren't looking as promising. And uh, this one at the top here, they believe that Tetrasun, who made some very nice cells a few years back, uh, were using these double tunneling poly contacts. And um, with the IBC contacts, um, SunPower has been using these poly tunneling contacts for many years now. Um, I'll finish up with heterojunction, which is quite an important area. So if you look at why the um, current is so low in the heterojunction, you can see it from the spectral response all this loss in EQE here is due to absorption in the layers on top. So one big development there has been switching the polarity of the cells. So formerly the P-type amorphous silicon layer was on top, N, N plus, so it's conventional front junction devices, but everyone now has switched to rear junction devices with N, N, P-type structures. And uh, in this structure, um, you can use the wafer to provide the lateral transport to the contact rather than needing the TCO to do all the work. So this is just showing the current flow. So they used to go up to the TCO and then across, but now they're finding their own way to the contact that's shown there. So that's opened up new possibilities. So this, this uh, structure in the back from Longji was already using that structure. So you've got some of the benefit of taking the pressure off the TCO. And just very recently, this paper has been published talking about um, uh, structures without any TCO at all. So I, I think that's probably a good way for the industry to go. There's some difficulty in making contact to the amorphous silicon, but apart from that, um, you, you get a one milliamp boost in current. So I just think eventually you might have to get rid of the amorphous silicon from these regions before and do selective contact type approaches. I won't have reason to go over that, but um, the other thing that manufacturers are doing are doing double intrinsic layers you have to prevent epitaxial growth uh, when you're depositing the amorphous silicon layers onto the silicon. And by having this first intrinsic layer, you can gear that to prevent that from occurring. Having the wafers off 111 also quite important. So that brings me to the end of my talk, but just to summarize, um, I think all the technologies there will continue. So as I said, I'm all are intrinsically capable of 27.5% efficiency and IBC efficiencies over 28. So what do you need? You need ongoing improvements in wafer qualities. So plenty of improvements seen, but we need to get to 30 millisecond lifetime to tap into this supercharged fill factor. Improved surfaces, less than two femtoamps per centimetre squared from the whole area, and some contacts are already demonstrating the capability to do that. And the reason you need it so low is to get the supercharged fill factor rather than voltage. Improved contact seasonal activity values that are 10 to over 10 to the over 15. So um, you need that to get the very high efficiencies. And uh, patterning polysilicon seems to be an area that would benefit many of these technologies. So just looking at what can be done specifically for the contenders. So with the PERC, I think um, going forward to the past is probably what's required. So going to the selective uh, polysilicon tunneling contacts incorporated into them, probably with the rear junction approach looks the most promising from the ISFH simulations. And then you've still got diffuse junctions replacing the aluminium back surface field, which has fairly high S values, but not as high as you can get with diffuse junctions, might put the icing on the cake. With Topcon, there's plenty of room for further optimization. I think uh, doping surfaces that have been undoped in some of these structures, doping them very lightly is important. And going to the two polarities rather than just one polarity will help along there. 
So for the heterojunction, we've got to decrease that absorption in the top layer too. And uh, the other big room for improvement is increasing the fill factor, the pseudo fill factor towards the high injection Auger limited. So I think that's the area for most immediate improvements, but finding a way of getting the current up, there's the other area. And with IBC, you know, the big question is polysilicon or amorphous silicon. So that's the end of the talks. Thanks very much for listening to me.